In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we know and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Now before Matthew 23, 23... We studied the fact that vows are not for use in this spiritual life. We have far greater things than vows. They did use vows in the Old Testament, but we are not to use vows today. The only legitimate vow ever used today in Christianity is between a husband and a wife. And the husband and a wife does make a legitimate vow, and that is before God. And therefore it is legitimate. But all the other vows are not legitimate. Because now we have a tremendous, unique spiritual life. And we do not function under vows. Instead we function under the two power options. The three spiritual skills. The four spiritual mechanics. The ten problem solving devices. We function under the most unique spiritual life ever. And we don't have need for vows. This is something the Apostle Paul We'll figure out uh, much later when we go through the Acts. Now in 2323, we are going to see something here, and that is our G- that uh, Jesus Christ is going to scorn the Pharisees for not teaching Bible doctrine. Jesus Christ is going to scorn the Pharisees for not teaching Bible doctrine. And there's going to be about seven different woes coming down through uh, these passages. 23.23 Woe to you experts in the law and you Pharisees, hypocrites! You give a tenth of your mint leaves, dill, and cumin, yet you neglect what is more important in the scriptures, justice, mercy, and teaching, faith. You needed to do these without neglecting the other. They were so tied up in teaching the taboos of the day. They were so tied up in teaching that they must give a tenth of their their leaves, their dill, and their cumin. They were so tied up in teaching about how they should be outwardly moral that they forgot to teach justice and mercy. And the Mosaic Law was completely designed so that uh, the leaders of the law could teach grace. That's what mercy is. And also to teach faith and teaching faith as you see here. So they needed to do all these without neglecting the other. And the other had to do with the, uh, the uh, circumstances in which they had to go through the uh, ritual. And the ritual was with reality, but instead they just simply went with ritual and forgot the doctrine altogether. So here is our Lord scorning the religious leaders. Now we have a mention of tithing here. You give a tenth of your mint leaves, dill, and cumin. And uh, the reason why tithing is mentioned is because it was a part of the income tax in the Old Testament. Now there were three types of tithes in the Old Testament, and we need to take these down. First of all, there was a 10% for the maintenance of the tribe of Levi who had spiritual responsibility. 10% for the maintenance of the tribe of Levi who had spiritual responsibility. Oftentimes the tribe of Levi would sing. And they had the type of uh, singing voice in which uh, they would sing for Israel. And they had a hollow area just below the brain in which it would make it very... uh, Well, they were very talented in singing, let's put it that way. And because of that, 10% of all the money in all of Israel would go to the Levites. Then there would be 10% for feasts. 10% for feasts. So actually every year, the people of Israel would pay, uh, whether rich or poor, 20% to the government. Now today, if you're really poor in America, you pay nothing. In terms of income tax, you just don't pay income tax if you make uh, 10, 10 to 15,000 a year. You pay no income tax. 
but in Israel, no matter what you made, you paid 20% every year. But then on the third year, you would pay even more. And that would be a 10 extra percent for the poor of the land. So every third year, you would pay 30% of taxation to the government. And that would be 30% for the poor of the land. So these are the three types of tithes. And uh, this was all related to government. It's not related to the church age. The church age does not have a system of tithing. Also, they had a system of alms in which people would give to the synagogue on the basis of their own free will apart from tithing. And this is what we follow today in the church. But all of these tithes, 10, 10, and 10, which uh, added up to 30 every third year, uh, notice no one today pays 30% to the church, and they shouldn't be made to, neither should they be made to pay 10%, because they're confusing the age of Israel with the age of the unique spiritual life. So there are tithes that were, that were for everyone, and they had offerings that were free will offerings. Uh, you could tithe uh, your 10% or actually your 20% every year. And if you had some left over, you could do an extra uh, thing for the synagogue and just give a little extra money on the basis of your free will. That was called alms. The percentage of the offering is never mentioned because you give is unto the Lord. That is, the offerings that are mentioned in the Old Testament, there's never a percentage given to those offerings. Tithing along with taboos have brought much evil of religion that has snuck its way into the majority of churches today. And the majority of churches today, it, even the Baptist churches, say that you must tithe. And tithing was a system of income tax for those in the land of Israel. And so they are confusing the dispensation of Israel with the dispensation of the church. And they're saying we need to tithe uh, to Israel uh, just as they did back then. But we don't live under Israel. We are citizens of the United States of America. And there is no need for us to tithe in any way, shape, or form. We give on the basis of what we wish to give based on our motivation and our love for God. So tithing along with taboos have brought about much of the evil of religion that has snuck its way into the majority of Christianity. If you destroy the volition, for example, now we get to something else. Uh, you see what we have here is the, the fact that the Sabbath day is, is expected to be for everyone. And this is what the Pharisees, Pharisees should have been teaching for the Jews is that the Sabbath day was for everyone who was in Israel. And, uh, but uh, they would not, uh, well, they would not allow volition in the matter. If someone would uh, decide to go against the Sabbath day and go working on the Sabbath, they would be thrown in jail, etc. And they really distorted everything related to the Sabbath day, and they destroyed the volition of the people in their own country. And if you destroy volition, whether it be husband to wife or wife to husband, you are destroying the very thing that resolves the angelic conflict. Everyone has volition and a choice to make as to whether they want to listen to the Word of God or not. So what they should have been teaching here, that is the Pharisees, they should have been teaching grace. Instead of adding taboo upon taboo and instead of adding a tithe upon tithe to the Mosaic Law. So what our Lord does now is insults them in 23-24. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat yet swallow a camel. What they would do is strain out a gnat and show it to the people. And they would say, people, this is what you're doing wrong. This is the gnat that I found that you've been doing wrong. Yet they swallowed the camel and that was what they were doing wrong. And they would say, this gnat here that we've strained out, this gnat is how you have sinned terribly. Yet how they sinned terribly was swallowed. They swallowed the camel. The camel refers to the weightier matters of the law that they take no interest in whatsoever. For they never teach God's grace, that is the Pharisees, they care nothing for God's grace. They never declare the gospel. They don't even know the gospel. They never declare rebound. 
They never declare the faith rest real. The only thing they do is declare a bunch of things from the Mishnah, a bunch of extra biblical taboos. Therefore, they strain out a gnat through their taboos, yet swallow the camel because they refuse to teach the entirety of the Word of God. Religion ignores the spiritual and emphasizes the material and temporal. Again, religion ignores the spiritual and emphasizes the material and temporal. Then in 23.25, our Lord's not done with these people yet. 23.25, Woe to you, experts in the law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Point one. Serving dishes in those days, uh, well, the dishes in those days had a big handle on each side of the dish, and they had high sides, and the idea for this was to keep the food warm, which is understandable. They didn't have the technology we do, so they would build these cups with high things that go up like this and then handles to keep the food warm. So uh, what, what, what this means is you may clean the outside of the cup and dish. And they were great with uh, what this means by analogy is they were great with outside morality. Oh, they could uh, out morality anyone. And in terms of just looking on the surface, you would think they were the most moral people on the face of the earth. And they were great with using taboos. And they were great with their vocabulary and saying, Lord willing, God bless you, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And they were great with uh, being able to uh, look or appear spiritual on the outside. Yet on the inside they were filled with extreme sin. And this is what I've noticed when uh, I went with my uh, in-laws to a, some of their churches. One was a Wesleyan. On the outside it was very whitewashed and holy. And you walk into the church and everybody says, A good morning, brother. God bless you. Hallelujah. And then you sit down and then they start praying. And it, all of it's a phony front. It doesn't tell. It doesn't give any indication of what they're thinking in their souls, except they're thinking, "Oh, you sinner, what are you doing here?" or something like that. So they look clean on the outside, like the cup and the dish, and that's because they follow taboos and out, outward morality, but on the inside, filled with extreme sin. An exterior system of morality is no good without the interior support of the mental attitude. The average Christian today definitely thinks he's moral. The average Christian thinks he's spiritual. But spirituality, remember, is in the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And so few people know how to be filled with God the Holy Spirit that it's dastardly. It's terrible what's happening to our country because so few people even understand that spirituality is to name your sins to God and be filled with God the Holy Spirit. Yet they think spirituality has to do with the outside. If they can change their behavior, if they can modify their behavior, if they can act holy on the outside, then everyone will accept them as holy. Then they will be holy. But the fact is, this spiritual life is the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and we can't see God the Holy Spirit. So the outside of the serving dish being clean is tantamount to morality, tantamount to taboos, and so forth. And morality, by the way, is not the Christian way of life. It's part of it, but it's not the Christian way of life. I mean, you, in order to be filled with God the Holy Spirit, you can't be fornicating. That is obvious. But the thing is, uh, moral, if you are just, just simply moral, doesn't mean you're filled with God the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of people today in Christendom who are very moral, but they're not filled with the Spirit, and they are whitewashed tombs. Or as it says here, they are clean on the outside of the cup and dish. They appear clean, but on the inside it's wretched, filled with the old sin nature. The inside of the cup is filthy, and that refers to two types of sins, of mental attitude sins and motivational sins. The inside of the cup being fil filthy is a mental attitude sin. Sometimes it's hard to see a mental attitude sin, especially if people mask it with a smile. And you might really hate someone 
but instead of going up to them and telling them what an SOB they are, you might smile at them and shake their hand, etc. Yet on the inside you hate them, and hate is a part of sin. So on the inside of this cup is nothing but mental attitude sins, which uh, eventuates in the motivational sins of revenge, revenge motivation, etc. Now the religious always avoid obvious, overt immorality. The religious people always avoid obvious, overt immorality. You won't catch a religious uh, person committing fornication. That's overt. You won't catch a religious person getting drunk. That's overt. You won't catch a religious person doing something that would be construed by mankind as being immoral. But you may... Uh, if you have enough sense, catch a religious person gossiping, maligning, judging, trying to destroy someone, in inordinate competition, inordinate ambition, trying to get ahead in the church because they're holier than everyone else. And that means that while the outside is clean of overt sins, the inside is wretched with all types of inner sins, of the mental attitude sins, which are the worst sins, by the way. So religion always emphasizes the exterior and ignores the mental and the motivator. Religion always emphasizes the exterior and ignores the mental and the motivator. And uh, they, they emphasize the exterior because most people emphasize the exterior. Most people are superficial. And if someone acts holy, someone acts sincere, someone does this, someone does that, then uh, you think of them as holy. But this is phony. And we can't see the inside of people. Yet, uh, once we grow up enough spiritually, we can know whether someone is out to rip us apart, gossip, malign, and judge, and tear us down. Uh, we can know that, but by then we don't care. Because if we know the inside is clean, what do we care what other people think? And we don't. But religion always emphasizes the exterior. I've changed my lifestyle. I have done thus and so, and I have done thus and so. I have become a better person. That's all exterior. If they're still gossiping, if they're still maligning, if they're still judging, they're rotten on the inside. And this is what our Lord is saying. He's saying, oh yes, you're a pretty cup and you're a pretty dish, but on the inside is gook terrible, nasty stuff that stinks. So in 2326, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may become clean too. Now when you wash dishes, do you only wash the outside of the cup? I hope not. I mean, maybe when you're younger and your parents say wash the dishes, you just do the outside hoping that uh, they'll never look at the inside. <laughs> But then when somebody goes to pour milk in the thing for some cereal and they see all these globs of meat, they're going to vomit. So you must wash the... In it, actually, it would be better to wash the inside than the outside because that's where all the food's going to go. But you wash both. You wash both the outside and the inside. And the world's worst people are the people who put on a phony facade. The world's worst people are the people who cleanse the outside of the cup, yet on the inside it's filled with sin. There's no power. There's no power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And when people simply cleanse the outside of the cup and they have no power of the spiritual life, they actually drive people away from Christianity. And why not? If you're a bowl full of stench... People will run from you. People will run from the stench. And what is that stench? Your gossip, maligning, and judging. And a lot of people have gone into churches and they may have been seeking an answer and then uh, all they do when they sit down is hear a bunch of people gossiping about each other and it gives them a bad taste in their stomach so they get up and walk out and never get the opportunity to hear the gospel. Now if they want it, they will hear it somewhere else, of course. God's not going to leave them hanging. But there are so many people who are turned off by this facade of uh, religiousness and instead of just being frank and having the inside cleaned as well as the outside. So there's no power in that. 
Now what it says here, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may become clean too. To the Pharisee, this applies to salvation. The Pharisee is unsaved and needs to believe in Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. Now to the Christian, it applies too. And that is 1 John 1, nine, And that's why Lewis Ferry Schaefer said 1 John 1, nine is a John 3.16 of Christendom. And that's because when anyone believes in Christ, all of their pre-salvation sins are forgiven. And the cup is wiped clean. The inside of the cup. The outside of the cup might appear clean, even as an unbeliever. But when you believe in Christ, the inside of the cup becomes clean. And all post-salvation, pre-salvation sins are forgiven. Now, if you're a believer and you go into legalism and you've been out of fellowship, the inside of the cup gets dirty again and you try to make the outside of the cup appear clear. That is in legalism. In antinomianism, you dirty up the outside of the cup and you don't even care. But in uh, legalism, you don't want people to uh, look at you as being unholy, so you make it as clean as you can. But for you, you must use 1 John 1, 9. And if we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And when we do that, the inside of the cup is cleaned. That's why John 1, 9 is the John 3, 16 of Christendom. Now moving to 23, 27. Woe to you, experts in the law and you Pharisees. Hypocrites. Notice how many times He's called these people hypocrites. By this time, you would think they would all leave, but they don't. They just uh, stand around for the beating. In fact, they're standing around. What they're doing is they're standing around, and every time he calls them a hypocrite, they get angrier and angrier and angrier. And that's why eventually they're going to hang him on a cross. Because he, our Lord doesn't care. He's going to teach them doctrine, and he doesn't care how angry these people are going to get at him. So he says, "Woe to you, experts in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites!" Once again, you are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of bones, actually, full of dead men's bones and of everything unclean. Now, the tombs back then, they would make them look very beautiful and white, especially near the time of Passover. And they did this because uh, p- pilgrimage, they would have pil- pilgrimages coming from all over the world to go to Israel on the day of Passover. And one of the rules for the day of Passover is that if you cross over the grave of a dead person, you are unclean and you cannot uh, go to Passover. So what everyone would do before Passover, all the Israelites would go out and make sure that all the tombs were whitewashed so that everyone would see them. And they would be a bright white marble so that no one would accidentally cross over the tomb or step over it. Just make it very, very white. And so our Lord makes an analogy to this. You are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and of everything unclean. You see, if they walked over the grave on Passover, they would become unclean. And he is actually saying, uh, you're very beautiful on the outside with your temporal morality, but on the inside you're wretched. So a whitewashed tomb is the grave of a poor person that is washed before the Passover. A whitewashed tomb stone is the grave of a poor person that is washed before the Passover so that travelers can see and avoid the grave. That is so that they will not become ceremonially unclean for the Passover. In Acts 23.3, Paul calls the high priest a white-walled or a whited wall. And this is one of the greatest insults you could give a person. And uh, only a Jew would recognize it because they, they're used to uh, whitewashing the tombs. This has real, uh, very little meaning to us. But for the Jew, this meant a lot because they would make sure that the tomb of a dead person was very white. And so when the Apostle Paul would come, go up and call somebody white-walled, that was an insult. What you were doing is saying, oh, you're phony. You're phony on the outside, but on the inside you're full of wretched dead men's bones. And the Apostle Paul actually insulted people in that way. And the high priest who was standing before the Apostle Paul as Paul's judge, who was to judge him, uh, became uh, very upset and had one of his uh, other people slap him across the face. And then the Apostle Paul said, God will slap you across the face. 
And eventually that did occur, of course. So Paul called him a white, whited wall. In other words, you have a nice suit on. You look nice. But on the inside, you're a low-down rat. And that's the way most people in religion are today. They look pretty on the outside, but on the inside, they're a low-down rat. And in most churches today, they have a phony uh, front. And they'll treat you sweet and kind so long as you don't uh, cross them with doctrine. The first time you ever cross them with rebound even, the most simplest of doctrines. The first time you cross them with faith alone and Christ alone and you don't invite Christ into your heart. The first time you cross them with uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that's the only way of salvation. That Those outward clothes come off and you begin to see and smell something wretched. They'll attack you and destroy you. And that's because they're religious. But on the outside, as long as you don't mess with them concerning doctrine, oh, they'll, they'll be your best of friend. But it's hollow. It's shallow. How many of you have seen Shallow How? Shallow How? You've seen it? You should watch Shallow How. It's about a man who... Uh, what happens with this man is, uh, well, he likes, well, he likes women, but he's kind of a chubby man. Uh, but his uh, standards for the other women are very high. And the only way that he'll go out with any woman is if she is knocked down gorgeous model type. But he's not so hot himself, so he has a hard time with this. So he goes to the big tooth man. What's his name, Dallas? Tony, Tony Robbins. He goes to Tony Robbins, and Tony Robbins, Robbins bops him on the head so that everyone he looks at well, he can see the inside of people now, not just the outside. So he starts dating some three, four hundred pound women, and his friends think he thinks he's crazy, but now he can see the inside of people, and that's the whole point of the story. Well, uh, this is what our Lord is saying here, is that these people, they put on a phony front, but if you could just see the inside of them, you would know how wretched they were. And a lot of people who, uh, a lot of people with doctrine are a lot more beautiful no matter what their exterior experience, uh, external uh, look. I can't believe you've seen, never seen Shallow How. You'll laugh. It, go rent it tonight. You'll laugh. It's a hysterical movie. It really, don't you think, Dallas? It's funny. So, woe to you, experts in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you look righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And that has to do with the fact they look, uh, they look spiritual on the outside. On the outside, they use the typical words, Amen, Hallelujah, and anyone would say, that person's so spiritual. But on the inside, they're full of lawlessness, full of gossip, maligning, and judging. Wretched people. 23-29. Woe to you, experts in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, again. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. What, what happened back then is these experts in the law would go up and uh, decorate the tombs of people like Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, and all the prophets of the past. But the funny thing is, the prophets in the past were killed by the Jews. But they're going around uh, decorating the graves of the righteous. 23.30 And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have participated with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. And this is where they are way out of line because, in fact, they are going to participate in shedding the blood of Jesus Christ. They're way out of line. If we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have participated with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. And that's a lie. They sure would have. And then our Lord says, By saying this, you testify against yourselves that you, that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. And they are. They are the descendants of those who murdered Elijah. They are the descendants of those 
who, well, didn't murder Elijah, but they're the, the descendants of those who persecuted Jeremiah. They, actually, they did murder Jeremiah. They stoned him to death, and they persecuted Elijah, and they persecuted everyone else who was a prophet. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have participated with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. And that's a lie. By saying this, you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. And what, we're, what we have here is a basic point. Religion hates truth. Religion hated the truth back during Elijah's time. Religion hated the truth back during Isaiah's time. Religion hated the truth back during Jeremiah's time. Religion, Isaiah stood for the truth. Jeremiah stood for the truth. Yet religion hates the truth. And they are the children who hate the truth. And many today hate the truth. And if you were to give one sliver of truth to a lot of people, they would about have a conniption fit. If, I've seen it before in my own dealings with people. And I've seen it because I've played tapes for some of my friends who are good friends and they've had a very wonderful personality. And I played a tape and my pastor would, uh, of course, as he normally would, and he would say, you cannot invite Christ into your heart. And I, I tell you, the, the look on their face, it looked as if they were going to have a heart attack. But it's the truth. And you can't... When it comes to the truth... And then you try to explain it to them, but they're so shocked by that time, it's just too late. And uh, no amount of explaining... When you hate the truth, no amount of explaining the truth is going to help. And when you get into religion, religion hates the truth. And then in 23.32... This is why our Lord's being so tough with all these people. And He's being tough because... It's the only way they're going to listen. Fill up then the measure of your forefathers. Well, he's really... Uh, we'll see what he's doing here. To fill it up to the measure is to kill our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, you're about to fill up to the measure of your forefathers. You're about to kill me. You are the adult sons who killed the prophets. And you have a lust to kill because of your mental attitude sins. They envy our Lord. They are jealous of our Lord. And they express it through their area of weakness. And they desire to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in 2333, our Lord knowing this, really begins to lay down the law. And He says, You snakes! You offspring of vipers. Now that's phenomenal. He's insulting them one up one side and down the other. And he's not even uh, sugarcoating it anymore. He's taking the gloves off. And he says, you offspring of vipers. And in the same way, the children of Israel were called vipers. And they were struck by vipers and died to sin face to face with death. They were a generation of vipers. And so are these people a generation of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? The only way is faith alone in Christ alone. But they've rejected that. So our Lord makes it very clear. How will you escape being condemned to hell? And they won't. All of these people are going to go to hell because they've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and they're nothing but snakes and they're nothing but an offspring of vipers. For this reason I am sending you prophets and wise men and experts in the law, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And this refers to, of course, there will be the Apostle Paul and others who come out later and will be flogged and sent from town to town. So that on you will come all the righteous bloodshed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel. Now remember Abel. Abel was a believer. Abel was a grace man. Abel had a grace attitude. Abel uh, would go up and sacrifice the sheep, and that would be his way of saying, Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for me. And that's what Abel understood. But then Cain came along, and Cain was a religious man. 
And guess how Cain thought he was going to heaven? Because he worked on a farm and made a whole bunch of uh, tomatoes and uh, all sorts of other things that they had in the garden. I don't even know what grew back then. Probably the same stuff that grows today. Tomatoes, peas, all that stuff. And so he would grow this stuff and the, and, uh, and the Lord wasn't satisfied with it because he wouldn't believe in Christ. And he would uh, bring up peas and corn and tomatoes to the Lord and he would say, that's not what I want. And it wasn't what he wanted. What he wanted was faith alone in Christ alone. And since Abel would sacrifice the lamb, that indicated Abel's faith alone in Christ alone. And it showed that when he cut the lamb's throat, it showed that he believed that the, that, that all the sins of the world were will be poured out on Christ and judged. So Abel was the believer. And then Cain comes along who does not believe but tries to get ahead through his farming. And then what happens is Cain becomes very envious and very jealous of Abel. And he says, hey boy, let me see that knife you use to cut that uh, sheep's throat. And so Abel, not knowing, said, all right, this is what I do. I take the, I take the lamb and just like that and it bleeds out and it dies. And so uh, Cain said, well, let me see that, brother. And he takes it and he grabs old Abel by the head and goes and kills him. And he drops dead. And that's what religion does to uh, those who have faith alone in Christ alone. It's antithetical to it. And so that's why we have here the blood of righteous Abel. And even in the Old Testament, it talks about how the blood of righteous Abel calls up from the ground. And that is where the punishment of uh, Cain goes on and on. To the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So here's a listing of uh, some of the Old Testament uh, uh, saints who were murdered by religious people, from Abel all the way down to Barakiah. Then in 2326, I tell you the truth, this generation will be held responsible for all these things. That should have sent, uh, sent shivers up the spine of all those listening because this means that the fifth cycle of discipline is about to overtake Israel. And this is why our Lord says in 2327, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. These are two examples of negative volition expressed through religion. When he says Jerusalem or Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, this is the, the killing the prophets and stoning those are two examples of negative volition, all of which expressed through religion. It is religion that is killing all the prophets. It is religion that w seeks to kill our Lord Jesus Christ. How many times I wanted to gather your children together, like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. They were negative to the Lord Jesus Christ. They were negative to grace. They were more impressed with religion. They were more impressed with who and what they were. They were more impressed with what they could do. And they thought that they could impress, impress God by who and what they were. But you cannot impress God by who and what you are. God is not impressed by us. God is impressed by who and what Jesus Christ is. And if we fulfill the unique spiritual life, we receive blessings on account of it. 23.39 For I tell you, you will not see me from now until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is uh, taken from Psalm 118.26 it's part of the hymn that dealt with the millennium and how it begins. So blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the beginning of the millennium. And this is when a lot of the generals who have been fighting and have went to spiritual maturity and a lot of other believers in the uh, Israel nation. And of course, that's when all of us, we will be residing in heaven, by the way. But all of us will follow the Lord Jesus Christ down to the earth uh, in the millennium. And we will rule with Him in the millennium if we have succeeded in the spiritual life. If not, we'll just wander around in the millennium. But if we've executed the spiritual life, we will actually rule with Christ. And Christ will rule Israel. And uh, some people might be uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Commerce, 
Somebody might rule over here in America. Somebody might rule in Canada. Someone else will rule in Baghdad. And there will just be different rulerships given out depending on how far you went in your spiritual life. And all of this occurs right here in 2329. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now tomorrow night we'll begin the Olivet Discourse. And this is something that's widely misunderstood, but something that we will clarify, and all of us will understand it very well tomorrow night. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning these things, and may we know that we must grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may we not be tempted by religion, and may we av avoid religion, so that we might grow in grace and glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.